Um, before we go any further, I just wanted to say a few words, um, you know, of thanks. Uh, thanks to the people who have put this conference together, specifically Rekha Hasetti. I don't know where she is. Uh, she's been hovering around. I wanted to thank her in particular and her team, Solomon, of course, and Punita Kala at the Institute for South Asia Studies. This really has been an amazing conference so far, and, you know, every panel has brought such interesting insights for me as someone who is a little outside of the world of business. Um, but I hope that we can continue uh, with this panel as well. So the panel is called uh, India's Healthcare Sector Feeling All Right. And I thought I'd just give you some broad, very broad, basic comments about um, the healthcare sector itself. As you have probably heard in some of the comments today, it is booming, uh, in a word. Um, there are many, many opportunities for investors, also for innovators, and even healthcare recipients. It's an industry that is growing by leaps and bounds, something like 16, 16 16.5% every year. And uh, at present, it's around $160 billion worth of, uh, as a sectoral part of the Indian economy. And it's expected to double, essentially, in the next five years. There are obvious bright spots um, for this sector, including hospital management services, medical equipment services and devices, robotics, AI, diagnostic services, medical tourism, analytics and consultation offshoring, and alternative healthcare systems. That being said, I also have been you know, educated enough to realize that there are some serious challenges as well, and none more so than continued tight regulatory regimes, sluggish public health expenditures, issues around affordability and exclusivity, urban versus rural access, something that Vivek talked about a little bit, or maybe it was uh, uh, Mr. Bunsell did, actually. Um, Cost-effective technologies, impediments to concept, to product innovation. And so, you know, in some ways, the goal of this session is a twofold one. One is to celebrate and offer ways to improve on what is already working. And I expect the panelists will have a lot to say about what is good, what is strong about um, the Indian healthcare sector right now and the direction in which it's moving. But it's also to consider some of the uh, lagging areas and to suggest ways to address these challenges. And what I'll do basically is to ask our three panelists in the order that they're seated um, from Eric through Preetha and onwards to Clifford to say a few words, maybe for a few minutes or as long as they think is necessary to kind of give you a sense, some sort of broad marker of where they're coming from because they have very distinct fields of interest and expertise. And then I'll ask the panelists to perhaps ask each other if they have any questions, ask them of one another. And then we just open it to the floor to questions. Um, and I think that that is often the most educated way for all of us to um, you know, learn from one another. So Eric, um, over to you. for including me in this uh, really unique uh, exchange. I think um, it's rare that you're asked to come and think uh, hypothetically, as, as we, we've been inundated with hypothetical in, our, uh, in the United States and in the congressional hearings, but, uh, but once again, a hypothetical um, about uh, what could we do better to strengthen the existing uh, educational platforms that are already up and running in the respective countries and specifically how can India uh, take better advantage of a willingness on the part of UC Berkeley and its access to Silicon Valley and the Bay Area in general, it's a remarkable area on many levels, uh, to uh, fertilize uh, and uh, keep uh, watered uh, the intellectual talent that is uh, uh, pushing uh, to come out uh, in both of the respective <coughs> settings. I come at this from the perspective of those who are largely out of medical care. Uh, I um, have done very little work in the for-profit sector. Uh, I look at populations and I see who, uh, I see disparities uh, and uh, have pretty much dedicated my career to understanding the importance of quantitating those disparities and following them over time. 
I've also appreciated the critical importance of being in partnerships with those entities in society that carry the responsibility to respond to the burden of disease that the population reflects. Uh, that, in part, is your private sector. Uh, it is necessary, often specific expertise, subspecialty uh, training, uh, subspecialty uh, expertise, access to treatments that are not readily available in the public sector, uh, for diagnostic dilemmas, et cetera, uh, come in through private sector relationships. Uh, but the quality and sustainability issues uh, are more on the government end of public sector engagement. And the truth is you need both. And it's understanding the importance of creating platforms that allow for both of those sometimes diametrically opposed agendas uh, to move forward to embrace the same population and not allow issues of pay uh, to pay for services become barriers to access of care. India's population has about 75-80% of the population choosing on their own, especially in the arenas of tuberculosis and to a lesser degree HIV, to go to public, not public sites, but to private sites for preferred care in those settings. At the same time, the government has been frustrated with not including the public uh, sector information systems around surveillance, the incidence prevalence numbers of a given disease, how that reflects and distributes across the population, across, across the geography, and how that does or doesn't relate to the resources available to respond to those needs. Both when done in concert, in a cooperative way, often in partnerships with the private sector, uh, can raise all the boats for both the individuals who are workers within the private sector's uh, uh, companies, their families, and those in and around the sites that are stood up to respond to those needs. I'll just um, end with, uh, so I, I think that's the tension and the dilemma that I, I really wanted to put on the table. Clifford has dedicated much of his professional career to looking at those disparities and <clears throat> taking the next step to respond to them uh, from a corporate perspective. I think um, that H, the TB burden in India is something that I should just give you a quick overview of. Out of the 10.4 million new infections that occur annually with tuberculosis on the planet, uh, 2.7 million uh, come from uh, India. About 420,000 individuals die, about 1,000 a day, a little over, die uh, each day in India from tuberculosis. TB, again, is a disease we can diagnose, we can prevent, uh, we can treat, and we can cure. 85-90% of the time for drug-sensitive infection. Uh, it's unconscionable that we cannot put a delivery system, stand it up to make the, to successfully, reliably diagnose and treat a disease that we've had the ability to treat for 35 years. That having been said, there are dilemmas around and in, um, inadequacies in our ability to diagnose effectively and to start the correct medications, to treat for six month periods of time, uh, to establish the cure, uh, and to keep track of that individual through the system. Uh, I think um, that all of those uh, challenges were present with HIV uh, and are present for primary care. <coughs> And I think looking at how the commonality of the challenge really does boil down to standing up a delivery system that can respond to primary care needs of the population, including the large killing infectious diseases, uh, but a platform that can expand into non-communicable diseases is the next challenge. And India has defined that and has positioned itself to engage with it, but is just starting its response. So I will uh, end with that. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, it's, it's interesting to see that, you know, from the morning in every session we've had, there's been a conversation about healthcare. 
And this didn't really happen even three years ago when we first started coming, coming to Berkeley for this. Healthcare was just one session and none of the other speakers even <coughs> alluded to healthcare. So something has changed over the past three years and the level of consciousness of what a country has to do for their healthcare, for their population, has gone up tremendously. We all know that education and health is a fundamental right. And it's up to every government uh, to provide adequate and uh, of a certain level of quality health care to its people. And I think now the government of India has become extremely conscious and has tried to do whatever they can over the past 12 months to put policies in place. And to me, that is, you know, that, that's the most exciting, uh, it's the inflection point of India's healthcare system and what is going to happen, the potential opportunities, and of course the challenges which we face. Because I think, you know, as we said earlier, not, nothing comes without a challenge. But how many of us can really take the challenge and then make it into an opportunity and in health to do it with a mindset to actually serve the public. And these are little snippets which actually came from all our earlier speakers this morning that, you know, one, uh, Mr. Chambers said he really wanted to give back to society. And I think healthcare is perfectly positioned to be able to be in a position where we have to give it back. I just want to explain what India's, you know, the, the healthcare uh, landscape and the context is, because the context is very different from most countries. The budget is a central budget for healthcare. So, you know, every year there's a certain budget allocation for, for health, which then is apportioned to all the states. You know, we have uh, 20 odd states, seven union territories. So, it's apportioned to the states. Some of the states do very well in their healthcare delivery. You know, the governments and some of the, especially the southern states, are doing extremely well in their healthcare delivery, in their policies, in their execution, and in their adoption of technology, uh, training of manpower. There's some others who now are looking at it as, as a priority, and there's some other states which are so large and so complex that honestly they don't even have a clue to, you know, begin the first few steps of execution. So we, and then we have the public healthcare systems, which are now, you know, just because of data and education and everything which is available are trying to upgrade. And then there's a not-for-profit sector, which is doing a tremendous job in the delivery of healthcare. And you know, you heard about the CSR budget a little earlier. A lot of the corporations are saying, you know, let's use the health, our CSR budget to give back for healthcare because you know they understand that the population needs. I come from a sector which uh, which is a for profit, and it's simply because you know my father, U.S. is this, is our second home. He was a doctor here, came back to India because his father said you're not going to achieve too much for the country by sitting in the U.S. You better come back. So he came back with the four of us. My mom had a washing machine and a, a dryer. He had a car. They sold that and they started their first clinic. So that's how, you know, the story of our hospital system started. But he's constantly telling us that, listen, you know, it's not enough if you just have a healthcare ecosystem and medical schools and hospital beds and clinics and pharmacies. What you need to do is to find processes, methodologies, uh, awareness for people to really look at processes which will act, keep them out of hospitals. You know, the emotional, uh, the emotional gain is from keeping people out of hospital beds, you know, to cut down healthcare expenditure. And to me, that is the biggest challenge. And all that which we learned and spoke over the past few days about technology and AI, if it can really become a methodology to deliver cost-effective solutions uh, to people in, in countries like ours, and not only India. Everybody needs cost-effective solutions because somebody is paying for healthcare. It may be the insurance companies, it may be your employer, it may be cash like people do in India, but the thing is somebody is paying for healthcare. So there's a responsibility for delivery of cost-effective healthcare and I think that's, that's where technology is going to play a huge role. Uh, again, an Indian company has shown, you know, how can you use, how can you provide mobile telephone services at zero cost. So, you know, if somebody can do that for, for telephones, 
why can't somebody provide health care at the lowest possible cost? And I think uh, India, with, with just the need, with the necessity, and with the push from the government, is going to provide answers not only for you know, our population, which is a huge population, but maybe solutions for the rest of the world. And I think that that is where we're coming from. And there's a lot of research. Uh, there's a lot of manufacturing inputs, manufacturing research, going into seeing, you know, can we provide cost-effective solutions? Uh, the pharma industry is one of the largest. So, you know, when you had that huge uh, figure about the size of the industry, it, it included pharma. So, so that's why it looks so big. But the service industry, healthcare service industry, is not so big, simply because a lot of it is not charged. You know, the government just provides it. So we don't have actual and factual data on the size of the provider part of the industry. But, but, but it is good. Uh, what can we do? I think uh, we can do a lot. Uh, we will definitely, as a country, leapfrog and try and adopt the best practices because I know when I was I started working in the hospital it was always the American way you know how can we provide health care in India the way they do it in the US but today we're very proud to be Indians and we say why not the Indian way and you know Indian health systems are actually giving the same outcomes same clinical outcomes at one-tenth the cost and we are 35 years old uh, as a company, the prices which we started with for cardiac surgery, 35 years later, it's still the same price. So I think India is doing something very right in some areas. How can we take that as a process and how can we really, you know, spread it across not only our country but other geographies? Because there are huge lessons to be learned from, you know, both healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. And if we can find a way to heal the world, why not? Because everyone needs to dare to dream. And that's probably what the Indian dream on healthcare is. Right, thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks to the AIMA for the invitation. Um, so I'm with Gilead Sciences. We're right across the bridge. Gilead is a company that research, develops, commercialized medicines, mainly in areas of unmet medical need. So HIV, AIDS, viral hepatitis B. We have a cure now for hepatitis C. We have uh, medicines in research for Ebola, dengue, Zika, um, oncology, inflammation. Um, one of the things that we noticed several years ago was that um, these medicines that were prolonging lives that Ambassador Gusby, who was the ambassador for the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, um, we saw a lot of funding going to Africa, going to other countries to help treat patients with HIV. We had the medicines that prolong lives in the US and Europe, um, but trying to get them to Africa and South Southeast Asia was very difficult. One of the things we did was we, we, we looked around, we, went, we looked at China, we looked at everywhere, and one of the things we found was that Indian manufacturers are the best in the world when it comes to manufacturing high volume, low margin medicines. To the point we signed a, a, a voluntary licensing arrangement with Indian manufacturers. We have 25 of them now, Mylan, Cipla, Hetero, Zydas, others. Um, they, we have now are reaching mainly Sub-Saharan Africa and others, 11.5 million people daily taking some version of our HIV medicines and 98% of that is from Indian manufacturers. So you have, it's, it's, it's a scene that I remember from Steve Austin, the astronaut, um, an old sitcom show, I'm dating myself, now, but you have the people, you have the technology um, right there in India, and you, you're supplying others. I, I grew up in the West Indies, by the way, the best cricketers in the world. <laughs> Used to be. No. <laughs> Let me repeat that. No. <laughs> Think about it, though. Think my, about it. We'll have a conversation off. after. <laughs> so I grew up in the um, West Indies, and um, you didn't get American medicines. You got Indian medicines, and 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 we always said that um, Indian manufacturers are the pharmaceutical engine for the poor. 
because we're from poor countries in the West Indies. You still see it in Africa. There's a lot that India is doing well. The one thing I see is, um, is that it needs to add more to its health care infrastructure, because health is a strategic priority. Everything we hear about today, um, it will be sad if someone, right, and we see this in Egypt and other places, right after they're graduating from their university studies, they get the first job, that's when they have the insurance. They go and get tested, they have advanced liver disease, mother to child transmission of viral hepatitis, either B or C, and they need a liver transplant. Um, you, we need to get to primary care. Um, we see some perfect examples happening in, with Moody Care. We, we met with uh, Tata Trust recently, and Tata and Moody did a tie-up to provide viral hepatitis screening, and that's a good step forward. We see very good initiatives in Punjab, but I think for, for a country of 1.3 billion people, um, you can leapfrog. The U.S. doesn't have um, a, a stable health coverage for the poor. I, I don't like to say universal because that makes it look very big, but comprehensive primary care. It's important. It will allow people to catch things earlier. And then everything that you aspire to achieve, leapfrogging and IT, and I'm an engineer, so engineering, um, you'll do that with a healthy um, work environment or healthy individuals. Um, we have a drug-free bowler right now, and it's amazing what happens when you get a spike in Ebola in the, in the Democratic of Congo, and it takes out the entire healthcare system, particularly the, the doctors and nurses. So I think the conversation needs to be continuing around health as a strategic priority. I'm <laughs> glad to hear that now it's, it's, it's taking um, uh, uh, more of a center stage. And um, I'll leave it there. But we, we are here doing some good research. India has what it takes to create the, the best in class healthcare system. And, and it's already leapfrogged China, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Clifford. I was just wondering if anyone on the panel had questions for one another, um, comments that you'd like to make. You know, Frida, I wanted to ask you about. Um, you said you also. Uh, engage with nursing training and healthcare worker? Yeah, I think um, one of the biggest challenges our country faces is that we don't have uh, skilled manpower. You know, we might have the resources to build the physical infrastructure, and we might have uh, the resources for the drugs and the pharma and the devices, but we don't have ma the skilled manpower. We don't have enough doctors. You need... Um, one doctor for, you know, the, the two doctors for every thousand plus population. Uh, we need to, you know, more nurses. And we have 15 nursing colleges among our own system. But then what happens is that, you know, we, while we absorb all our nurses and then recruit from wherever else we can, they do leave our country for, you know, better prospects overseas because the salaries and wages which they would get uh, in, in our neighboring countries is so much more than what the system in India can afford. So there must be a solution for that, and we're trying to see what we can do. Uh, same thing with the physiotherapists and pharmacologists and just allied healthcare workers. We churn out now about 40, 45,000 allied healthcare workers, you know, so these are ones which would, you know, help people which would do like the, the cleaning of hospitals and, and things, and just different kinds of jobs which healthcare workers do. But even that is not enough. So it's, uh, that's probably one of the biggest challenges, that just train manpower to you know, serve even half our population, which is um, six, 600, seven, 700 uh, million people, is itself a huge yeah. challenge, even mm -hmm. if they have some coverage or the other. I just have one quick question. Um, you know, we talk about the healthcare sector and we think about obviously the healthcare sector in this country oftentimes. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts as a panel about the correct balance between public and private and how would that be achieved? Um, and I'm really thinking here when, you know, you call a program something like Modi Care, are you, I mean, it, will it inevitably become politicized in the way that Obamacare became politicized and resulted in all the kinds of 
problems that accompanied that delivery system. Is there some way to keep the politics out? And so I guess the question is twofold. One has to do with the balance between public and private, and then the politicization of healthcare and, and what your thoughts are about that. So I think it's a, it's a great program. So, uh, you know, there was this whole initiative by Mr. Neelakandi and the former government to bring this unique identity. We don't have social security. We don't have identity cards. And, it, and the present government, you know, still goes with it. It might have changed the name. So Modi Care, if there is another government, which is not, you know, Modi's government, might, it might come in another avatar, but I don't think it's going to go away because people understand that it, it's really going to reach them. Uh, have we connected all the dots? Have we built, you know, such a strong process or ecosystem to go to that last mile of delivery? I don't think so. But, but to me, it's work in progress. And uh, 10 years from today, the penetration might go up to about 60%, which itself is huge. You know, if we can manage 60% penetration and delivery of Obama, I mean, uh, Modi care to, uh, to our people, I think we would have done, we would have done a great, great. job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think it will continue. I, I, th I see um, a lot of positives to it. I think in the US, uh, it's politics, and, and that's what um, causing it to to be where it is today, but I'm I'm really looking forward and confident about what we see in India. Um, one of the things, Preeti, that I would love to chat about after is um, under the umbrella of uh, access operations and emerging markets through Gilead, we spend a lot of time financing public health initiatives, education and training of ancillary healthcare workers. Because when you get to Africa in some remote settings, you don't have a physician. You have the village chief who might be the ones um, administering or passing out the HIV medicine. That's the ASHA worker. So we will, we would love to partner with with you on that. So something good has already come out of this initiative uh, today, in my opinion. Eric, your thoughts on? on well, you know, I, I would just say that um, oftentimes that. The decision to not have um, a available delivery of health care to the population that is not uh, driven by a profit margin as the motivation for the uh, doors to stay open, uh, but some hybrid of it uh, is, I think, better for sustaining uh, and getting um, uh, you know, sustaining uh, delivery systems at the level they need to be, and introducing the ability to uh, have an effective quality improvement system that actually improves the quality of care over time, and to have the surveillance system that can measure that to reflect that to the policymakers. Um, to achieve that, a stronger, more aggressive partnership with government is something that I see is either never done or it's the last thing done. Mm -hmm. And I know the problems in working with government. Uh, that I p spent most of my professional life working in government. Uh, and it is a much harder road to go. But I have come to realize that you cannot stand up the uh, delivery system needed for the population with multinational NGOs uh, or with uh, um, with just corporate-driven, profit-driven interests because the ability to be responsible for the group that's over the hill or in the next province is not necessarily in the business plan. And it may destroy the business plan, but those people are still there. So being in a relationship with those who embrace that responsibility to understand and deliver a quality of care to everybody, I, I think is a critical uh, piece of the pie. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree, Eric. The, the, the whole idea of a public-private partnership is one that, that can be very symbiotic. Um, Eric, the, a question I have to you. One of the things we run into quite a bit um, in India is uh, it's the regulatory landscape to get HIV medicines or hepatitis medicines into country. So um, we, we typically have first FDA, US approval, then European approval, WHO approvals, and then we go to the, the, the um, DCGI and, and, and they're saying, 
well, you need to do a complete study all over again. And we need about 2,000 individuals. Um, and we say, well, we had American Indians uh, in the study. It, it doesn't matter. Um, what do you think can, can it's possible? Because, um, you know, it's really a hurdle. And, and it, it prevents life-saving medicines from getting to India faster. Yeah, Clifford, I, I've seen it over and over again. The, the tension often comes from the sovereign nation's desire to remain sovereign, have their own process, and really is often responding to interests in the country of entrepreneurship that is talking to political leadership that they want to preserve this area as an area of engagement. Completely understandable. It's what capitalism is all about all over the planet. But in the ability to raise the number of people who get in front of the science we already know and have the appropriate drug delivered for the appropriate diagnosis, uh, it often doesn't happen. And uh, I think we all share in that responsibility. We cannot say that someone else's uh, job. We, because we are there, capable and able to understand and grasp that problem and are working in the sector, should be part of the solution too. Uh, and uh, I think uh, companies such as Gilead who have actively asked themselves, how can we increase the number of people who can benefit from the product that we have put all of this R&D into and money into to realize uh, becomes part of your goal as a corporate interest, to embrace that as part of the goal. Uh, and I think Gilead is one of the uh, uh, best examples of a corporate embracing of, uh, of issues around real access. So, uh, so I think the planet, I don't see an, a quick solution. Uh, Dr. Tedros at WHO sees this as a problem. He's articulated this specific problem. Uh, the will to have a consensus discussion because of the sovereign nature of countries is low, but it's where we need to go. He wants to convene a process, uh, and I, uh, I believe he uh, will do that. I don't know how successful it will be. Okay. So I think, sorry. I'm sorry, because it's India, uh, you know, everybody was a bit reticent, but you will see there's, there's a sea change. You know, even in the policy makers, and they understand that we really need uh, drugs like this to help people get better. And if it's made in India, of course, you know, then, then there is a distinct advantage. Mm -hmm. But uh, having the, the authorities going through a trial all over again, there's a lot of dialogue going on that if it is FDA approved, then, you know, you don't have to go through the process. So I think some of uh, the drugs are getting out of that. Um, hopefully it, w it will happen because the need is so tremendous. Now it's an opportunity for you to ask questions. Um, maybe the gentleman over here in the front. Okay. Yes, my, my question the mic's The mic's coming, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, my question is to uh, Prita. Uh, I am a strong believer that artificial intelligence can absolutely improve outcomes, quality outcomes, and, and reduce the cost of delivery. We, in the US, it's much easier because the data is cleaner, you can get access, and AI depends on the, on the data sets that you have to develop the models. What are the barriers to bring such technologies to India from accessibility to data and the data privacy rules? So uh, in, the, in the private system, um, we use the same data privacy as HIPAA, so a lot of it has to be HIPAA compliant. And uh, the multiple uh, networks which are really using AI, especially in the area of you know, radiology and, the, and in the diagnostics, uh, the government, we have been contracted by the AP government to run their PHCs, their public health centers. And one of the requirements which we, we decided would make it more cost effective, just like you said, was to use AI for diagnosis. And uh, the data protection, of course, uh, is an issue, but I think that, you know, there are a lot of very bright uh, officers who understand it. And if you put those systems in, then I think it, it, it really answers that, uh, that issue. 
So, so it is work in progress, and there are like five pilots running in the country, uh, two of which we are doing, and you know, there are a few others which, which are happening. And the of the data, because a lot of times it's handwritten notes from physicians, you know. How, how is it uh, captured? In, in so EMR is not uh, not really available. Even in you know big, big hospital chains like us, some of uh, the hospitals would have an EMR. So a lot of it has to be cleansed uh, and then uh, put into the data systems. Uh, but it will happen. Uh, you know, all the government hospitals are now looking at EMR. So I think somewhere down the road it will happen. Mm -hmm. If you ask me, is it happening today? I think just in the form of pilots. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, the question about uh, you know, data, again, extending that a little further. Clinical data has always been important for you know, medical devices, medicines, etc. Today, data is being collected in multiple ways, not just in trials, but also in usage, you know, post-launch data, etc. Uh, market access, intellectual property often is a debate around, you know, uh, affordability, you know, doing some form of, you know, corporate charity in a new emerging market. Is there a capitalism-based model where a country with so many people like India can use data to pay for quicker access, lower prices, etc.? It's not yet done, you know. So there is a lot of data getting collected. Medical devices is probably easier, you know. Everybody using a medical device provides data to improve it with the AI, right? Mm -hmm. So with, if 100 million people use a medical device instead of 2 million in Belgium, right? right. You improve medical device uh, performance much better and the corporation can give some, some of it back right. through lower prices. Is that possible? I, I think it's possible. There, there are companies like Verily and, and others who want to access that data. They want to understand how people are, uh, the medical journey. Now you know you need good CRM systems, um, or how you transfer it from paper to, to, to some kind of technological base, which I think the mobile phone is, is what will be the future of that. But um, I, I think all of that can be capitalized and sold. It's just a matter of time, and, and you have to get people comfortable with with the fact that the data will will be will not expose their medical information or them them, so the whole HIPAA piece is necessary on that too. But I see it as a future, especially when you have so much people that you can uh, learn from. So um, you know, there's a very fine line between uh, capitalism and the ethics of really monetizing data, especially if it's healthcare data, I don't think we've cracked that yet. Uh, I don't think uh, we have very stringent systems and laws in place yet because um, we haven't visualized the fact that there's going to be humongous amount of healthcare data available in the not too distant future. Uh, have we thought about, you know, data protection? Have there been norms laid down? I think, you know, they're talking about it. It's not available yet. So we have to be, in fact, uh, very conscious and cautious about our data and not give it away thinking, you know, there'll be some immediate gains. Um, so I think it, it is a bit of an ethical issue, mm -hmm. which um, more and more as we're getting into it, we're becoming very aware of. The gentleman with the mic. This morning, the focus was on technology and now the healthcare. I'd like to kind of try to link the two. Uh, we get the impression from listening to many speakers that Indian engineers in India and in the valley work very hard to make life comfortable for American citizens. And through medical tourism, maybe you're keeping some Americans healthier. <laughs> My question is, do you subscribe to the notion that healthcare and connectivity is a fundamental human right? If we agree upon that notion, then different societies, different countries can achieve that by different methods. The fundamental question is, should healthcare and connectivity be uh, a human right? Excuse me. The gentleman in the green shirt over here. Oh. In the third row. 
Sorry, maybe one of you should. Yeah, I, I think it should be a human right. I mean, when you look at um, what you can do with connectivity, um, right now we're piloting, well, we've supported through a grant a pilot in the Kabira slums of Kenya, one of the largest slums with 2.5 million people that were putting health coverage on the mobile phone. Not a smartphone, a basic mobile phone. And it has a health wallet that the individuals can now, if it's a day laborer that receives payment, they can use some portion of that payment towards um, health. That, that, is, that is something that, um, if you thought years ago, um, someone in a poor village, um, slum having a mobile phone, you would think, well, why do you need it? But here you have the marrying of, of technology and health coverage and primary care. So I think we're looking at farmers now being able, with internet access, to, to research how to get better yields out of their crops um, um, and what kind of um, non-toxic pesticides they could probably get to use. So, so the idea of technology transforms individuals' lives tremendously and it should be available to all, in my opinion. that Gilead has uh, sponsored. Uh, that's, uh, she works for PBS and thankful for Gilead. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. The gentleman here with the glasses and then in front of you. So I have a question for Preeta. Um, so the private healthcare sector in India is in a unique position where it can make a big sea change um, to uh, provide primary health care to bigger society. Right, especially the people who cannot travel to bigger city um, or even to the nearest hospital, right? So, and Indians are very entrepreneurial people. So, have you ever thought about ideas like Uber for primary healthcare, where you provide the means for the people to go and maybe open a you know small clinic, which is backed by uh, a, a big group like yours, right? Where people could still work for a profit, but it has bigger impact in the society. So we did this about 15 years ago, and we were before our times because we did not have the technology to even back it, and it failed miserably. I think now with the right you know, process, technology, and uh, systems to monitor it, you know, we are the largest telemedicine provider in the world today. On any given time, there's about uh, almost 500 telemedicine consults happening somewhere within the system. Uh, so I think now we will be equipped to do it. But we started this program and it failed so badly that we actually had to shut it down. Mm, interesting. The gentleman here and the gentleman at the back then, we have about maybe one, maybe two questions after that and after shut down. So. Yeah. My name is Sarvant. Uh, my question is for Preeta. Uh, last year, there was an article published in Lancet Journal that talked about 300,000 children being born every year with congenital heart defects, out of which 90,000 children die before their first birthday. That means per day, about 250 to 300 children are dying. So with a corporate group like yours, what are the initiatives that you are taking to screen these children, number one? And you mentioned earlier about the surgery costs remaining the same over 10 years. And most of these children cannot afford those surgery costs. So whether as part of your CSR or special initiatives, are you doing anything further to help these causes? And also with the Ayushman Bharat program, with those money available, will that help changing this condition? I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, when it comes to children or providing interventions, it's never enough. And so we started a program called Such, which was Save a Child's Heart. And the saddest thing about, uh, you know, India and our culture is that if it's a girl child with a heart problem, they'll think twice before an intervention. So it was first educating them and then finding the money for it. But I think we've got, uh, and it's not only Apollo, and I'm not talking on behalf of just, you know, my organization, but uh, Narayan Hrithyalaya, for example, and uh, some of the others, they're doing phenomenal work in, uh, in pediatric cardiac surgery. We ourselves do about uh, three to 4,000 
children, you know, on very low costs, which, you know, the material cost is funded by, again, some corporate or somebody. So the CSR budget for the Save a Child's Heart such is uh, to the tune of almost 12 crores a year, so about a crore a month which again is enough to do a certain population. I don't think it will answer the whole thing, but, but it's catching on and there's a, there's a lot of work going on in that space. But the saddest thing is even now, if it's a girl child, they think twice. And I think that, that bothers me more than the fact that we can go in and actually do an intervention. We've got two more questions. It will, Sorry, it will. Um, The lady over here and the gentleman there. Um, I think it's wonderful that all the conversation is being steered toward preventive care now and that we're talking about how to invest technology to kind of prioritize primary care. Is there something to be said about the differences in how the Indian healthcare consumer um, views healthcare? As in like here in the US, I think we prioritize going to the doctor early on, but I think in India, I feel like the average middle class um, Indian still is very reactive in terms of their own health. So. I guess just going back to the root of how do you incentivize people to kind of change or shift that attitude? So, you know, one path-breaking initiative was the fact that there is health insurance now. And uh, the utilization of health insurance is growing at about 30% every year. So, you know, people know that they have an answer and they can go and access health care, which is one point. Second, Modi Care has given them um, a potentially a way to, you know, for interventions because there is uh, insurance coverage in the plan. Uh, the third thing is that people still are very afraid to go for preventive health. You know, the, uh, a lady in India would think 10 times before she went for a normal health screen. Uh, she would tell maybe her husband or her son to go, but but they don't go. And I think it's it's a bit of a cultural thing, and uh, it is changing. But if there is more and more encouragement of you know preventive care, I think then then half the problem would be solved, and and that only comes from just constant communication and education. I think Thank also um, this exists in the United States as well. Um, I think when you look at certain socioeconomic classes, you don't have the engagement um, and, and even access to care. Eric would know from, if you look at new prevalence of HIV AIDS in America, it's in, in the southern states, in the rural south. Uh, we have a drug to prevent HIV now. Um, and trying to get that to individuals or get individuals who are at risk to take that medicine is a challenge. Yeah. We have one last question, the gentleman over there, and then we're going to thank us. Yeah, my name is Suresh Subramanian from Hewlett Packard, and we're fairly active in healthcare in India. Um, great panel. Um, the question that I have for all the three panelists here uh, a uh, the discussion is largely focused on HIV, tuberculosis, hemp C. Um, over 60% of the deaths in India are attributable to non communicable diseases, lifestyle diseases. Uh, question to the panel, are you seeing population health programs get in place? What are you seeing? Where are the openings there um, where we're now starting to target the ones that are more tied to lifestyle than, uh, mm. than uh, infectious diseases? I think that's the whole idea of primary care. Um, but you still have the, the, the component about um, even with access or, or primary care is to get individuals socialized to going and seeing the doctor on a routine basis. Um, the, the biggest thing that, that, that I wake up and think about every day is that you have someone who's HIV positive who you've treated for 20 years, they've given birth, that, and you can prevent that baby from becoming HIV positive, and then that person dies of a heart attack. I, at some years later. So all of that investment just, just went to nothing. And, and that's why we're really focused. You say, well, why should we focus on, on um, NCDs, non-communicable diseases? It's because it is the bigger, bigger elephant in the room, for, for lack of a better word. Um, you have individuals who are seen and treated for HIV for years, and no one really has looked at the blood pressure or noticed that they've had this, um, this sore that's not healing. So I, I think the conversation is happening, 
but it has to come from both ends where individuals are actually thinking and, and addressing or, or utilizing primary care as a, as a means of, of um, not having these catastrophic illnesses occur. I think the communication for, you know, raising the awareness on NCDs is, is completely not enough and uh, we need to do so much more in that space. Just raise the level of consciousness and I think that would probably be, not, not only for a country like ours, but for most populations, I think the NCDs are the biggest killer and we have to work on that. Yeah. I would just echo uh, in, a, in agreement with uh, everyone on the panel. Um, uh, I, I think that there is a, uh, a, a, you diminish your ability to respond to the, all the needs of an individual if you, as a policy delivery system, decide to chop up your budget into vertical program funding of single diseases. And that fundamental distortion starts at the donor level and at the reimbursement level with payment schemes. And it reinforces a compartmentalized, fragmented delivery of health care when in any given patient, individual, person, uh, it happens co concurrent simultaneously. And the delivery system should be sophisticated enough to respond to all of those different needs. Uh, and I believe we have allowed thing, it, it's not the science, it's not the difficulty of figuring out how to do that. It is other um, uh, profit concerns that change the way healthcare delivery systems think about taking a blood pressure, doing a weight, checking a fasting blood sugar and cholesterol in everybody that you see. And all of the cost considerations that converge on that numb and immobilize delivery systems. I would challenge all of us to say we're smart enough to figure out how to work through that. Uh, we all want for ourselves, our families, our children, our parents, health care that covers their needs, not just the vertical disease that they happen uh, to be able to name. Uh, that a funder wants to fund, that somebody will stand up an individual clinic just for one disease for. Um, and uh, all of which many of us in this room have dedicated our lives to doing. So I, I say it with, with fondness. But, uh, but it's time that we evolve into a more mature and I would say more responsible um, response to what has been a very evident need really since the beginning of uh, humans living in groups. These, these needs have been present. And um, I believe that we can put our minds together to figure out how to respond in a comprehensive way that deals with all those, um, all those uh, varied uh, diseases that come in at different ages. So. All right, please join me in thanking our guests. Um,